Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming for today's uh, first webcast uh, from Comet Technologies. So uh, I will try to make it as informative as possible. I would assume a lot of you have used uh, memory forensic before. Um, so I'm just going to wait uh, a tiny bit for like some more people to arrive. But uh, yeah, the idea of uh, today's webcast is to be able to uh, provide more information and to share also like my feedback uh, on what I've seen with memory forensic. Uh, you should be able to talk in the chat or to ask any questions at any point if you have any. Uh, if it does not work, you can always uh, tag me on Twitter and ask me a question uh, through Twitter directly if you tag me at, uh, at mswish. So for the people who don't know me, uh, so I've been involved in the memory forensic uh, since, since 2007. I first got into the memory uh, forensic uh, scene through the Windows hibernation file after reversing Windows kernel. Uh, I published a tool called Sandman. So that's when uh, hibernation file forensic uh, started to become a thing. Uh, it was uh, very interesting because uh, the hibernation file is basically like uh, a memory image which is compressed and which has a file format, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, I will explain why in uh, the following slides. Uh, also, uh, the following year, I started a tool called Win32DD, uh, which I renamed like as Dump It in the future. Uh, it was one of the uh, numerous tools for uh, memory acquisition on Windows. Uh, it was quite popular, still pretty popular. Uh, and in between, because I had a chat actually with someone this week who was saying, oh yeah, we used to use uh, Dump It, and then it kind of like disappeared. Uh, and it's true, it only came back on the radar like two years ago. Uh, the reason for that, if you're wondering what happened to uh, Dump It in between is because uh, I was working on a different startup called the Cloud Volumes which was doing application virtualization and we got acquired by VMware in 2014. So that's why no activity happened around the dump it around that time. And uh, in between also like did some uh, security conferences, like the most recent one is uh, Upcode. Uh, we're actually going to have uh, an edition in Kenya in two weeks. So assuming you're around, uh, you should come uh, join us. And we just had our second edition in uh, April in Dubai, uh, which went uh, really well. Uh, so like I was saying, uh, Dump It came back on the radar two years ago. Uh, that's basically when I started uh, Come. And the mission of Come, so we do multiple things. So we do services, but the main like product line is around memory forensic. So also I'm saying, yeah, let's make uh, memory frenzy great again. And uh, the t-shirt you see is like the conference t-shirt from uh, last year. So that was, uh, that was pretty funny. So uh, as you probably know, like memory forensic is powerful, uh, especially, especially if you do like forensic, but mainly for like incident response, uh, but it's too complicated. A lot of the problem we see now is uh, it's too uh, it's slow. A lot of the tools are not really uh, reliable if you are like uh, analyzing like a large machine, and if you do incident response on like law enforcement for like forensic, you want to be able to analyze uh, servers and servers. They won't have like eight gig of RAM. Uh, some of them are gonna have like 32, 64, maybe 128 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, it still requires a lot of manual operation. Like knowledge transfer is a big problem. Uh, in security in general, but when it comes down to memory forensic, uh, in 10 years, uh, I don't feel like, I mean, it's still more popular now than it used to be, but the interest around memory forensic uh, from what I've seen so far is still like uh, very thin, which is uh, something that can be uh, easily improved. So automation is uh, pretty bad from what I've seen. So that's why we are trying to focus on automating like the whole workflow around it and to provide uh, tools, you know, that we actually test uh, 
and that are reliable. Uh, and if you look around, like um, just like automation is a really big thing in security. You now, uh, if we look at security orchestration, for instance, and for the people who currently focus on memory forensic, uh, a lot of them uh, still focus only on the raw memory dumps. Uh, so that's what I call like a dump dump, you know, and uh, me using the IOP, IOP logo, you know. Uh, and they're not interoperable and they're like a dumb format because you don't have a lot of the information that you need for analysis that you can collect during the acquisition. Well, you don't, you just have like your raw copy of the image and that's it. So which makes like the analysis process much slower and sometimes not even uh, reliable. And the fact it's not interoperable, assuming you're going to look for something uh, really complex uh, because it's important to keep in mind that often uh, attackers are like one step ahead from uh, defense uh, people. Um, you know, people can argue saying like, you know, like at attack is like uh, easier than defense, defense is easier. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, people coming up with new techniques. Uh, on the offensive side are like uh, offensive people. And often you don't notice those techniques like until much later. You know, if we look for instance at what happened with Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar last year, the techniques that were being used were very advanced. We're talking like in-memory patching uh, in kernel mode. So that's not the kind of thing that you're gonna be able to uh, analyze with your like regular open source software. And having access to proper like kernel debuggers, if you eat something really complex, uh, like Windows debugger is very useful. But also having images, you know, like at a specific point in time, which is a concept I'm going to explain uh, after, uh, is also really interesting because it allows you to do some uh, retro hunting on assuming that between uh, two different period of time, you got some new knowledge about the new different techniques. So you can always go back and look if that was present. So our main focus for memory forensic is mainly for incident response. What we tell enterprises and incident responders is to think of memory as a log. So if you have critical assets, it's a very good thing to take like uh, snapshots at a very uh, at different period in time. So having the periodical memory images is pretty good. And the reason for that, like I was explaining, is that you can always go back in time, analyze what's new. Uh, we have seen it in the case of like double pulsar last year. Uh, that stuff was pretty advanced. And being able to be like, okay, like that's something that was around like four or five years ago. I got some snapshot from like four or five years ago of my critical assets. I'm thinking, especially in the banking industry. Uh, then you can analyze those old images and reinvestigate them or go for like specific like uh, stuff in memory that could be like uh, very uh, good. Um, so like I'm saying like uh, regex on uh, event logs is cool, but depending on uh, what you're looking for, like if you're using like some uh, log aggregation stuff, it's pretty good. Uh, I guess it's enough for like probably like 80% of your needs, but for the remaining 20%, that's where uh, you're gonna have to be innovative and try to be like ahead of the curve, especially when, like I was saying, there's like new techniques being published that get out like years uh, later. So like I was saying, Windows uh, debugger is pretty good if you want to go into more details, but our main goal is not to have incident responders to open like a debugger or like a command line tool and to look for stuff manually. We want to be able to help them to take away like 80% of the work that they currently do manually and still give them a very solid option for the remaining 20%. And also it allows like people who are not as senior with like uh, Windows internals and uh, such like things um, to be able to take over some tasks. So even like internally, what I see a lot actually, which I still find uh, very surprising because so my background is more like security research. Uh, but when I talk with enterprise, the actual like security teams are like uh, very small in general. So resources are like uh, pretty low. Uh, 
a lot of people say they have SOC and everything, but usually like human resources is often a problem. So being able to have like some more junior people to do like uh, or check things for you uh, is pretty good instead of uh, require uh, requiring internally to have someone with like 10 plus years of experience. Uh, so as, as you know, memory forensic is pretty good to do a deep dive inside the operating system for like uh, either like structures. Uh, it provides you more visibility uh, in addition to endpoint uh, protection solutions that are currently in the market. So a lot of them are still like pretty good now, but we had some cases where uh, we had people like contacting us saying, while we're using this uh, EDR, we get some alerts, but to be frank with you, like sometimes, you know, I, I want to double check things. So like the best way for me to do it is, okay, I can run some script on it, but I like memory forensic for that, like using the endpoint as an entry point alert and then uh, doing like some memory acquisition on a specific machine and then uh, doing a deep dive on that specific, on that, uh, specific machine. So the things we would look for in memory would be like anomal structure relationships or patch APIs. We can also uh, have like some integration with some file reputation like virus total, which is pretty good. So if you want to check for like non-signatures, the way it works is you don't send like the entire binary, we just send an hash uh, that we, we compute from the memory. So that's pretty good. So you don't so you don't have like data like going to virus total because I know it's some uh, or like those reputation database, which I know is a problem for some uh, entities. And uh, like I'm saying, we uh, we also like try to use like machine learning to reduce like false positive as much as we can uh, based on things we have seen already and that we know are not like a threat, for instance, like antiviruses uh, that can be also a, a bit uh, invasive sometimes. So uh, the example I like uh, to give uh, in the case of like uh, threat hunting, uh, when I cry was a big problem, uh, shadow brokers too. So uh, as some of you uh, may know, like uh, I've been covering like, the uh, shadow brokers activity since like the beginning, uh, since like the moment they started to like release exports, uh, they called me out a few times. And uh, also when when I cry uh, happened, uh, we also analyzed it. We registered like the second kill switch. Uh, but the most interesting part around it, and uh, as soon as the shadow brokers like published like the exports. Uh, what really got our attention the most was double purser because it was like the first time we saw a public backdoor uh, leveraging kernel mode for patching. So like I was saying that uh, backdoor double purser has been active since 2013. So if you think about it, now we're in 2018, that's five years and people are still talking about it. There is. Uh, uh, I forgot it was a, if it's a DevCon or Black Hat, probably both actually. Like people are still going to talk about Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar. But if you think about it, you know, the back door is five years old. So, and if you, feel, if you think of like some of the attackers, uh, more advanced or less advanced, uh, the knowledge that happened in between uh, five years ago and now had been shared uh, among like multiple groups. Um, so now it's like the more the time passes, like the more uh, defenders have to be like more aware of what's gonna be a potential problem. So in that case, when the bulb pulsar happen, uh, we developed a technique to like recognize it in uh, memory. And in the case of the bulb pulsar, uh, one of the specificity uh, to it is that it would uh, modify one of the dispatch table, but it could also like repatch it after. So they were well aware of uh, people being able to detect them in memory back in 2013. And they even had some entry uh, forensic uh, techniques around it. And the assumption is, okay, if that thing was developed like five years ago, uh, what are the chances of something uh, similar, not the same techniques and everything, like not, not a recompiled version of, uh, double pulsar, but I mean, what are the chances of something as complex being developed between 2013 and now? And as we have seen, there is more and more uh, attacks 
again, say companies being published, a lot of industries are like lagging in terms of like security measure because they're like, especially financial services or oil and gas, because they're dependent on a lot of uh, legacy system. So before you had to be a nation state attacker, but the main difference now is, well, you know, like a lot of the knowledge is public, so you don't need to have like a lot of uh, R&D resources around. It. And that number is from the uh, uh, Microsoft website uh, for one of the, the endpoints. So they say like uh, hackers, there's uh, around like 200 days uh, before they get discovered. But, uh, you know, for having like such a big number, it means like in some cases, like it takes probably like multiple years which explains like things like double personal uh, not being detected. In the case of memory uh, forensic, wh why I like it. So like I was saying logs, if you have log aggregation, it's pretty good uh, for like 80% of the cases, but for the remaining 20% uh, percent, you're gonna want to be very creative. Uh, the way I look at it, uh, the way I look at memory acquisition is like similar to VMs, you know, when you uh, do like a snapshot uh, of a VM or you pose like a VM and you get like that state of the machine. So that's how I look at it. You get uh, a copy of the entire state of a machine, or your critical asset at a fixed point in time. And this allows you to go like uh, do a deep dive later on, uh, either with your team or on your own. So that's pretty useful. The uh, amount of information you can get of it out of it is uh, pretty important and it may not be useful now but it may be useful in three years down the road. Uh, there are two things uh, we're going to cover like today. So the first one is uh, our toolkit. Uh, some of you may have used like the Moonsault Windows Memory Toolkit in the past. So it's basically this plus some new utilities. Uh, so the toolkit is the offline toolkit for memory acquisition, memory conversion, and Stardust, which is the extension to dump it to analyze memory snapshots in a, in a friendly way uh, through our platform and also like to archive and everything. So in the toolkit, the main uh, utility and why most of the people go on our, our website now is to download dump it. So it works really well up to Windows uh, 10. Uh, it's free for personal use. And, you know, like we don't have any like uh, issues. Uh, it's maintained like uh, on our side. So because now with like recent version of Windows, there's a bunch of like certifications that you need to, uh, uh, to have to sign like your drivers and everything. So a lot of the open source uh, tools will not work on your version of Windows, for instance, because they are not properly signed. You cannot sign them as uh, individual. Uh, DMP to JSON. So we have a bunch of tools to convert like snapshots into different formats, but that one uh, is like the most recent one. The ID is you can pre-process uh, a dump into what we call a snapshot, which is like a bunch of JSON files. So even like you can open it uh, di directly like on your side if you want to check what's being sent. Um, and the reason we have this tool is in case you don't want to send an entire dump uh, to our platform, which uh, makes sense in some scenarios, you can pre-process it. So it just uh, it's just going to extract like the metadata information that you want to be analyzed. Uh, Iber to uh, be in noise open source, that's for Windows hibernation file. And uh, Z2 DMP is... Um, to decompress uh, like uh, crash dump that we generate with dump it. Um, so we created our own format to be able to do it from kernel mode uh, directly. And the reason behind it, uh, we will see it in the next slides, is when you try to do memory acquisition on very large server, uh, in certain cases like alpha terabytes, well, you want to have compression because like the acquisition time is going to be like cut uh, drastically and having a local acquisition or even if you like save it into like a remote like file share is much more efficient uh, if you have compression obviously we also have a powershell extension uh, which is aggregating a bunch of the different comments to help users to automate like operations so 
that's what happens when uh, now you use like dump it. So in this scenario, it takes like two minutes to acquire a machine with like a six gigabyte of RAM. So compressed, it was like um, like 2.5 gigabytes. Um, two minutes for an acquisition is pretty good. So that's why like not doing uh, regular acquisition is a bit of a waste of information, especially now like storage is pretty cheap. Like you can even choose to like do acquisition of your system, store them in your like local storage and choose to analyze them later or like periodically. Um, so here, if you do like snapshots, like uh, you, you get like a zip file with all the JSON files. So if you don't want to send an entire image to our platform, uh, you can just send like the pre-processed uh, snapshot. In the case of data acquisition, uh, like I was saying, if you don't use a like, compression, so if you have a server like that, you know, like uh, Windows 2016 uh, data center edition with like uh, four, uh, 430 gigabytes of RAM, well, it's gonna take you like a good like 50 minutes, uh, which is pretty long. Uh, so using compression uh, in those scenarios is almost something you want to do like by default. Uh, dump it will do it anyway. Uh, if there is like more than a certain amount of memory, it's just gonna be like, hey, we're using uh, compression, are you okay with it? And it's gonna take less than 10 minutes uh, if you use compression. So for for like those scenarios, that's uh, a pretty good like time cut. Uh, in terms of performance, like I was uh, saying, so obviously like it depends on how much activity there is in the system, but in those scenarios, uh, we, we are talking about like a pretty drastic uh, cut in time. So a lot of the acquisition that would take like one hour will take less than 10 minutes and uh, the acquisition that would take like 10 minutes will take like uh, two minutes. So that's a pretty good uh, time cut. Uh, regarding like uh, so Stardust, so which is our analysis uh, platform. Like I was explaining before, the idea is, okay, a lot of people uh, even now do like memory acquisition, but are reduced to like open it in an hexadecimal editor, look for like some strings. Uh, a lot of the, like, the open source tools are like uh, breaking. Also like now Microsoft uh, changed like their uh, patching policies. Uh, for uh, for like the patch Tuesdays. So you see like big uh, pack uh, of patches. So a lot of like these structures if they are coded like could just break. So reducing a lot of that friction to help like incident responders to focus on analysis is like our main goal. Uh, we take like constant feedback on it. We just want to improve it and make it like reliable for incident responders. I will give a I will give a demo right, right of that to this uh, display the platform. And our main motto, like I was saying, is memory is a log. Uh, instead of having like only XML files or uh, EVT files, you know, like which can be like uh, potentially modified as uh, we have seen with uh, Mimikatz in uh, one of the uh, scenarios. Uh, and also like archiving them, just like logs, you know, they're just like really big, like piece of logs, but if you have like some critical assets, I'm uh, particularly thinking, thinking of like some uh, uh, like key critical industries. Uh, storage is pretty cheap and having like your snapshots or like your uh, memory dumps stored in a local file share should not be much of a problem. And like I was also saying like multiple times, like being able to increase the analysis surface, it's pretty good because otherwise you're just reduced to look at like logs and you have to trust like your endpoints uh, all the time. So whenever you're gonna have something a bit uh, exotic, you will not be able to have a look at it. So the idea is like the analysis platform is cloud-based. Uh, so you don't need to like install anything. You can do retro hunting even if you upload something, you can always like go back in time and check it out. And like I was saying, benefits is just 
time saving, being able to see information that you will not normally see or that you would forget to analyze. Uh, with one of the pilots we did, uh, so the manager of the team gave like uh, an image to uh, one of uh, his team members. It was like, okay, like, uh, just analyze this and look for how long it would take, uh, like the manual operation would take like between one and two days, which is pretty common whenever you look at a machine. So being able to cut that time to one hour or less uh, is pretty, uh, pretty valuable. So you have two paths uh, for like the analysis. So you use dump it and you can send like the entire memory uh, image uh, directly. So you can compress it even as a zip file with, with like the uh, decompression uh, on our side. Or you can store it in your uh, on-premise file share, wait or run like DMP to JSON and uh, just send us like the actual snapshot and we will analyze that for you and uh, even like give you like the uh, opportunity to uh, look at the content. So one of the uh, case study we had is uh, not too long ago, it was uh, last year. Uh, so our client was struggling to find ways to find uh, a memory acquisition tool that works properly with uh, machines with more than 64 uh, gig of RAM because it would just crash all the time. And uh, obviously, if you have like some production servers, well, you don't want them to crash. Uh, and it's one of the main problem uh, with, with security. And uh, so in that case, uh, dump it was like a perfect fit. So if you'd compare, uh, and that's one of the main like uh, blockers for like a lot of the memory acquisition tool is just like, just, just don't, they don't work, you know? As soon as you like pass Windows 7 or Windows 8, that's it, you know, like a lot of the tools are just not working properly anymore. And uh, now we're given like the, uh, uh, well, increase like uh, market share for like Windows uh, 10 and everything. And uh, support which is like gone for Vista uh, and uh, all the older OS. Uh, thinking of like uh, incident response for, for Windows 10 is uh, pretty critical. Uh, so like I was saying, like the main point is like to cut analysis into like less than one hour. Uh, let me show you, yeah. I'm gonna give the demo now. Okay, so this is uh, our platform. Uh, hands raised. So that's once you log in, when you have access to our dashboard. Oh, question, how does that work? Uh, so I got one question, so what was that? Any comment on uh, Volex City uh, search tool for acquisition? I haven't used it to be honest. Uh, I, I will not be able to comment on it. Uh, but uh, I mean, whatever works, works. But uh, what we heard from people is they ended up like going uh, uh, with our tool, at least for our memory acquisition dump it because it was working flawlessly and it was pretty fast. Uh, but I'm not aware about like other people's tools and their performances. So whenever you log in on our platform, so like the main uh, reason people would just like come around is because they want to have access to the toolkit so you can download it. But uh, the main idea around it is also to upload your snapshots and have them to be analyzed. So you can uh, filter the machine or snapshots. So in this scenario, we can look at this uh, machine. So it's gonna give you like the regular information about like the actual snapshot, like the like timestamp and everything. But for one machine, you can have multiple snapshots that you take at different points in time. So we're gonna look into it. And once you want to browse inside, 
So here are the scan results. Uh, some injection have been detected in the drivers, DLLs, uh, DLN injection, and uh, different process, and some uh, various total information got sent back. Um, you can also see like the actual like uh, process tree, um, which makes it uh, much easier. And if you want to like link like sockets, uh, you can also do it uh, to a specific process if you want to have a quick uh, bird view uh, to it. And also like all the services attached to a specific like, process. Uh, or you can have it in a list, which is uh, also fine. Uh, so sockets, like I was showing, with all your connections. So all the interps, if you want to have a look at it with their uh, name actually resolves. Uh, callback, so if you want to check directly for anything suspicious, like uh, file system uh, notification uh, patches, um, or like all the create process uh, hook, which is quite common uh, to, to notice. Um, and now, so if we look at, let's say, drivers so we have seen in the uh, scan details which was here it said like uh, in one of the driver like something uh, was found so we're gonna look for it so here like the SRV uh, driver which is like the SMB driver uh, used by double pulse to do the in-memory modification so if we look at the, so we can see like on the, for each uh, process or driver or even DLL, so you can see like all those uh, information, you know, like uh, like the, the sections, the uh, imports, uh, like the major functions in the case of drivers, uh, the IO dispatch table. And for like certain like key drivers, like for instance, like uh, SMB drivers have like what we call a dispatch table which is what was modified by the double pulsar uh, rootkit. And for to have access to that kind of uh, information, that kind of depth of information, while well, you need like access to a Microsoft symbols anyway. So that's why a lot of the actual like uh, memory analysis tools uh, currently like uh, are not really leveraging that properly. And I guess like their focus is more like law enforcement rather than incident response. But that's the type of information you would see like here, be like, okay, that had been patched. That's not normal. Uh, here we even have like the memory address. We can see it's like a different like image base. And uh, if we go back to like the actual process list, so same thing, something happened with Elsas. So same thing here, we can have a, like the, uh, the command line, the information about the process environment uh, on one page. And here, if we look in the VADs, which was red, we see like uh, two of them uh, are red, so they don't have a name. So it was an injection. And if we look in the modules here, uh, they don't have a name, but we're going to click on it to have more information on this uh, specific module. And if we look in the actual section, we can see here that, so it's red, we click on it, and we can have access to the various total report uh, regarding that threat. So uh, 18 uh, of April, which, uh, which makes sense. And uh, so that's for the, the case where you have something like really complex to analyze, you want to like save some time, uh, do it like directly. Um, something uh, if you want to have like if you have like a lot of images you can do that easily like I was showing in the previous like uh, screen actually like see we we use it to analyze like a lot of snapshots uh, and the idea is really like to save time uh, primarily so if we look at some of the snapshots so we have like the overview here of like the number of modules so 4000 module uh, looking at that manually is pretty complicated uh, dll is just like so just like a random uh, image but like 2500 uh, uh, dlls you know like uh, service descriptor interrupts uh, drivers 130 so 
even like shims, which is like pretty good. So we can uh, have access to that. Uh, gives us some good uh, good information for like what's being uh, used. Um, if we want to look at even like objects, if you want to browse like the object, uh, you can just like browse it. So if we look at the Windows like object, so the idea is we give you like a first assessment, uh, which uh, and if you need to do like a deeper investigation because you have like a specific like doubt about something, you can always like go browse for it yourself to like verify manually, uh, check it. Uh, if like the initial like statement yeah, is not like uh, good enough uh, uh, for you, but in terms of uh, analysis, like that's uh, a pretty good uh, like time saving uh, regarding that. Um, So here, let's say also we have a, a user guide here, uh, which contains a lot of the actual like information that needs to be uh, checked if uh, required. Uh, that explains like all the toolkit uh, utilities and how to like upload images even like the actual like uh, the partial extension is uh, available on uh, on github so if we look at it uh, so that's public you can have access to the different comments so let me check actually here so explaining like the different comments to yeah, create like a dump file, send it directly to the server, convert it if you have like multiple ones. And the toolkit, so it explains like the different comments, uh, the main features of the platform. Oh, question seven. Uh, so if we're supporting Linux and Mac, so Mac we have something, uh, but Apple didn't want to give us like a driving, uh, like a driver certificate. Uh, so we, we gave up to it and, uh, Linux, we don't, uh, we don't look at it. So our main focus now is, uh, is mainly, uh, focused on uh, windows. Uh, do you provide online support to your clients if they have problems to interpret some results? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, so like I was saying, the idea is uh, we give like a first assessment through the platform. It's easy to share with your colleagues. Uh, you can like look uh, into it, even now we're adding like a feature to make some of the snapshots uh, public, uh, a bit like VirusTotal does. Like if you see something like people can have like uh, an image of it. So in some cases, you know, if there's like a, a road kit, which is new it's still kind of cool to be able to like browse an image uh so like uh so a, a friend was uh, calling it like a mem total as a joke uh do we provide certification uh for someone who is interested in memory forensic as a carrier uh we could potentially do it if we have uh enough uh like requests for it uh like depending if we have like some uh some uh, requests around like uh, training, those things. Uh, what about uh, memory and graphical adapters? So because it's not RAM in that case, that's like actual like inside like the memory card and everything. Uh, so we don't uh, look into it. Like in the case of, for instance, like SMM anyway, like we cannot have access to it. And even if you try to have access to it, uh, it, it would like the uh, GPU would crash. Uh, can can starters be run from a private client? So 
now like the current focus is like cloud. Uh, that's why we have this option with like the them to JSON, where you just where you don't have to like send us like the entire image. You just send us like the extracted metadata. So there is no sensitive data in it, like passwords and everything, and uh, that you can verify directly uh, yourself, you know, because it's like a JSON format. Um, but like uh, to be run from a private cl a private cloud, that's not something uh, that uh, we didn't get like many requests for it. So for now, we're not uh, focusing on it. Uh, but if you can go through the uh, hassle of managing like you on like containers and everything. Uh, that would be like a possibility. Uh, the graph view is awesome. What about the scheduler that can dump clients' memory metadata and submit for analysis periodically? Uh, yeah, that's something you can do like easily uh, through uh, like a PowerShell uh, script, you know, like uh, the extension I was showing, like the uh, PowerShell uh, uh, module. A lot of it uh, like automate, automate a lot of the uh, operations. So you can uh, just like create like a scheduled task in Windows, have it point to your, your PowerShell script, extract the information and then uh, send it uh, over. Uh, would this session be recorded and provided for us for later review? Uh, normally, yes. I don't think I said anything wrong. Uh, so it's probably gonna go public. Uh, add some more questions to certification. Any a recommendation on the frequency to take the memory snapshot in an enterprise environment? Uh, I guess it depends on your uh, like threat uh, model. Uh, if you think you're like uh, like a government entity, so potentially you're like really high risk. So I guess you would want to do that often. Or if you're like a financial institution with, uh, you know, like uh, some neighbors that are like uh, targeting you often, uh, like in Asia or in uh, Latin America, there's a lot of activity uh, against like uh, financial services. Um, but you know, if you're like, like certain countries, you know, where people just get in and uh, because like the routers have default password, uh, I guess, you know, like, it's a bit complicated. Uh, I know Come is more proactive, but in a reactive scenario, can Come display the process tree just on one log dump? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So like, what we do with uh, memory acquisition is we get an entire like a uh, memory image of it. Uh, but if you just want like the the process tree uh, from one uh, from one log dump, you know, like uh, like running like a task manager will be uh, more efficient. Or depending on like how much time you have in front of you, like uh, doing an acquisition, we're talking like few minutes. If you run the uh, let's say like uh, dump to JSON on your side because you don't want to have to upload it. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking like uh, another like 15 minutes to extract all the information, then you upload it, you send it, and uh, you get uh, your information like 15 minutes later. So that's uh, like pretty reasonable. Uh, is like the new version of dump it free for law enforcement or does it not qualify as personal use? Um, I don't know, guys, you guys have a lot of money, you know, like uh, I would love to help, but uh, we're a startup, you know, so actually it's one of the 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 the, the focus now is um, <laughs> I'm saying as that at the joke, but, uh, you know, man, serious uh, as a startup is kind of like because we don't have funding, you know, uh, we want to like stay uh, in the, as independent as possible. Uh, so like uh, hustling for clients is actually quite difficult. So having like a product that can uh, uh, to stand itself would be like pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, you know, like uh, it's pretty rare to get, uh, even after like doing some uh, public analysis of like ransomware and everything, uh, when it gets like used uh, by online by a lot of like law enforcement agencies or even like uh, commercial companies, uh, we rarely get like inbound requests. Uh, so, you know, like the open source slash, you know, like free, uh, 
when I publish something in open source, I know it's going to be taken. And if it's free, you know, like uh, if it would be a bigger company, like with like stable revenue, I would love to do it. But uh, unfortunately, we're trying to uh, generate like uh, some revenue to be a bit, uh, like sustainable. Uh, how do you pronounce uh, Kome? So you pronounce it Kome. So a uh, good question, uh, this one. In case of an entire memory dump uh, is uploaded to Stardust, does this tool allow to extract the full memory uh, range of a given process? Uh, so we don't give like the option uh, now uh, over like the uh, like uh, the web interface, but assuming you would want to, so because you have like a Microsoft crash dump and assuming like you would want to do like some more uh, specific operation. So something I recommend you to look at is our public Windows debugger extension. And so you just like load like your crash dump in Windows debugger with a bunch of comments. And here, so we have, I don't know. So MS uh, dump, so you can dump like a memory space uh, Onto uh, to the disk, and we also have because I would assume that's what you want to uh, would want to use it for uh, a comment to uh, like do Yara search uh, in memory. So you can just like Yara scan comment on a specific uh, process and load like your signature. And if you want to do it for all the process, you can just like script it over Windows Debugger. So in in the case where you would want to do, like more like specific operations. Uh, that's something that would be like uh, pretty good. Um, other tools available like Redline. Uh, oh, Kome stands out from that crowd. Uh, we'll try to reach out to them and if you have any feedback or feature request, uh, let's see who is more reactive. I guess that's uh, the only thing I would say to be honest. Uh, yeah, the fun question. Uh, of course, it had to be a French guy. <laughs> say, hi, Matt. Uh, are the uh, servers where Stardust is running PCI DSS? And uh, so, well, like the servers are like uh, Microsoft Azure. So, uh, you know, like uh, most of the uh, Microsoft stuff is like a pretty good something for like the storage. You know, we use uh, like uh, their, their stuff. So you should be like, uh, you, you should be fine. Uh, uh, good question. Is uh, the pay as you go pricing per gigabyte of computer memory uh yes it's per computer memory so even if you send like a like a compress like a image from like uh, the extracted metadata it's still going to be computed on the actual computer memory uh any more questions Let me do a quick, uh, yeah. So that uh, that extension also like uh, is pretty good. So that one is free, it's open source. So even if you want to contribute uh, or like send like pull request or like create tickets, you know, that's uh, pretty straightforward. But uh, you have like even uh, some cool stuff, you know, like uh, this one here. So you probably have heard of the new uh, Windows subsystem uh, for Linux. So uh, Alex UNESCO like uh, once published like a pretty cool uh, like script for that. So uh, we, wrote, we wrote it inside our extension, and uh, so you can list like the actual process uh, run inside. And why it's interesting is because like now it's really much expected, you know, like to see a lot of like Linux malwares uh, or like backdoors running on. Um, on uh, on Windows, if this uh, subsystem is enabled, 
And then if you do like if you use like traditional like forensic tools, well, uh, you will not even see it because it's a totally like different subsystem, different OS. So it will not even uh, appear uh, uh, on it. Which region the uh, Azure uh, servers uh, is using? So yes, uh, the uh, EU. So pricing, uh, where the pricing for dump it can be found. Uh, it can be found at this address. Um, if you have any questions like or like feedback or more information, uh, don't hesitate. They can uh, re reach out uh, to me like directly at this email address. Uh, we're, we're pretty flexible, you know, we're a small startup. So we don't really have like salespeople or anyone. So if you have any question or if you have like a, a specific budget, you know, like you can just like, just tell us openly and you know, at least like the, the tool can survive, you know. And uh, then we can like focus on working on the platform, like adding like new features, which is like uh, pr pretty uh, interesting. And um, I can share the, the slides after uh, if you have more questions, but the, the recording is probably gonna be online uh, tomorrow anyway. And uh, yeah, if you want to like uh, register, if you're not already uh, uh, registered on the platform, you just need to go on uh, my.com.io. So you just go there, sign up, and uh, that's it. You can download like uh, the, the toolkit uh, directly. So yeah, actually, like I'm just checking, like uh, how many of you uh, have used the uh, Dumpit before? Um, but uh, yeah, the idea is like it's pretty straightforward. It's like one executable, uh, just like drop it, uh, get your memory image, and that's uh, that's pretty much it, to be honest. So. And. Uh, my second question was if memory forensic is a big deal uh, for you, if you are actually like uh, uh, using it uh, a lot internally, because we got like a, a bunch of like mixed uh, answers to it. You know, often if I would talk to an organization, like one uh, person would say, yes, it's pretty interesting for us. It's very important. Uh, but I'm the only one in my organization to think that. Uh, some of the people be like, yeah, like we use it like uh, once in a while, you know. Or some of the people are like, yeah, it's interesting, but it's way too complicated. So it's interesting to see like the different like uh, answers uh, around it. Uh, I'm probably gonna publish uh, those uh, those results on, on Twitter anyway. Uh, it's always good to have like uh, feedback. Uh, actually, I forgot to ask. Uh, now I could have like us not directly to do a survey, but uh, yeah. And uh, if you like like this type of webinar, you know, it's like the first one, so we try to make it uh, like as informative as you can in one hour. But uh, you know, like the idea is like uh, even to give some uh, uh, more like uh, technical like webinars in the future to do that regularly. Uh, so I, I've been, uh, I've become a bit uh, like if you always travel to like uh, conferences, you know, like uh, it's a lot of traveling. So it's not always like the best way uh, to communicate to like a large audience. But uh, I think webcasts are like pretty interesting. And I'm talking as uh, someone who is also organizing uh, its own conference. Uh, can can start a scurvot binary file from the uh, memory. Uh, we don't do it now because like we assume like the information people would want to like uh, extract out of it uh, would be the one we're already displaying. So, but if you would want to do that, like I was saying using the, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, and it, uh, it may change in the future if that's something requested by uh, enough uh, people. But at the moment, using like the uh, Windows Debugger extension, 
is uh, probably like the, the best thing to do because you can just like browse it, uh, like even disassemble particular functions and extract it. Uh, if you want to open it in a disassembler like IDA, uh, just extract it and look at it. <laughs> Someone just sent a funny question. He was like, uh, we want to see you open uh, Windows structures and to uh, look for uh, look for malware. But that's, uh, to be honest, that's uh, the idea like behind the platform because like now you would have to do that uh, manually. You know, it's, uh, if you have multiple machines, uh, it's it's kind of like uh, harsh to do, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty long. Um, and in a lot of scenarios, you know, like uh, malware are like pretty much like the same thing, you know, like uh, I didn't show it like here, but if you want to look at the, uh, registry like to look at the auto run where you can uh, we have like a tab uh, directly that shows that uh, so you can see like the auto run uh, if you want to browse like the registry so now uh, it's uh, possible to do like through the uh, windows debugger extension as you can see here uh, you can just like select like your you know like the key you want to look at and just browse it directly uh, assuming there is something in particular uh, but now you can like already like get the all the auto runs and uh, the objects uh, directly and uh, through the platform. So just for your information, like the last uh, pool, so the memory is memory forensic uh, a big deal in your organization? Uh, only twenty five percent of the people today replied uh, yes totally. Uh, Eight percent replied yes, but we need to improve our workflow. Forty-one percent, so the majority replied, kind of from time to time. Six uh, percent, not really, but we are curious. Uh, and twenty-one percent, which is pretty uh, significant. Uh, it is for me, but my organization does not care. Pretty interesting uh, numbers. So. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it for today. I'm trying to go back on the oh, that's why stuck on the pool, close pool, sharing. So just to uh, to close uh, today's uh, webinar because I think it's gonna cut in uh, two minutes. But yeah, like our key recommendation is like uh, implement uh, an active uh, threat hunting strategy, regardless of what you do. Uh, in general, it's good to reach a maturity level where you can actually like uh, search for threat. Uh, memory forensic can be one, but it's not, it's not like the only way uh, to look for threat. Archiving critical uh, assets, uh, including their memory, is pretty good. Uh, relying on endpoints is good, but you should not rely on it alone. And, and if you are like a decision maker, you know, like uh, empower your team with uh, the resources they need, you know, uh, listen to them. Uh, that's something we see uh, being a problem quite often. And uh, something you can do is uh, have like some Onipod servers where you, uh, instead of like doing the, getting the memory of all your machines, you only get, uh, you know, like you create like a fake, like an Onipod where you get like the memory uh, quite regularly that you keep uh, analyzing from time to time. So that's a pretty good way to know if uh, an attacker is in, in your network. But some uh, some good like uh, gourmet uh, onipot, you know. So if you want information to register, so you can go on this website. Pricing information uh, are available at this address. And if you want to reach out to me, like I was saying, you can just reach out to me uh, at this email address directly. So if you have questions or pressing information, uh, don't hesitate. So thanks again for coming today. Uh, if you want to see more webinars like that, like don't hesitate to like send me a message on Twitter or over email too. Uh, have a good day. Thank you.